never do it. <laughs> He's joined a print shop down in Champaign, Illinois, which is the hometown of uh, University of Illinois. That's where I went as well. Um, this guy is really a definition of a print hustler. He grinds his way through, learned how to print, bought his way into the business, and really transformed it and brought tech into a way and sales into a way that I've really never seen in any other print shop. So super excited to have him here, Stephen Ferry. By a show of hands, who's a Printavo customer? All right, that makes this talk a lot better. I'm not going to try and sell you or anything like that, um, but I'm going to be showing everyone a lot of what we do in our shop, uh, and it's just a lot easier to call Printavo customers. Um, so my name is Stephen Farrick. I am 26 years old. I graduated from the University of Illinois uh, with Bruce. Um, today I'm going to talk about automation in my shop in Champaign. Um, has anyone ever been to Champaign, Illinois before? Woo! Um, so it's a town of about 100,000 people, um, and when students aren't there, it's a town of about 50,000 people. So it is a campus town, um, it is a Big Ten campus, and the university pretty much supports the community there. It's where there's a lot of farmland. And so uh, it's a much different community that's down there, and I'm going to talk about uh, the challenges that I went through in automating my business in Champaign. And so, uh, when I graduated college, I made the smart or poor choice of buying into a company called Campus Sportswear. Best decision I ever made in my life. Uh, it's probably the only opportunity I was going to have to buy a business. And I made that choice because I wanted to kind of make my own success. I sold a lot of apparel online out of my fraternity house. And I got to know the guys that were printing the apparel for me on campus. Push came to shove. I got to know them really, really well. I would spend all my kind of off hours talking to them learning about the business, and we started joking about, well, what if after graduation, I went into business with you guys? They're both 55 years old, kind of like my dad's. Uh, they have five Gmail accounts, four different iClouds, uh, <laughs> constantly updating their, their iPhones, uh, but they were like fathers to me. And I needed them because I didn't know anything about printing, um, but they needed me because their business started in 1947, um, wanted to progress to a new generation. So I bought into Campus Sportswear, and at the time they were doing pretty well. Uh, they barely had a website. Their only advertising was in the yellow pages. Um, those were their tickets that they used um, for orders, and they still did close to a million bucks. Um, there was only two of them, and two for one printer at the time. Um, one of my business partner's wives did embroidery on the side, and they were doing pretty well. And so I had to give it to them to say, wow, you guys have something that's sustainable, profitable, opening up your home. And I wanted to be a part of that. So I went to school to study engineering, systems, operations. And when I first got into the business, I came to them with a plan. We were going to buy this beautiful building. We were going to go take out loans. We were going to buy all this equipment. Um, and we were going to build this ship. And uh, it was going to take off. And my business partner, Tom, who his father started the business in 1947, said, sorry, dude, you're going to have to learn how to print first. And uh, in that first two weeks, I was like, uh-oh, what did I get myself into? But what I was learning was that my business partner really, really wanted me to actually learn how to print, really understand the business, just like his grandfather did. And those are real pictures of our shop um, back in the day. So I picked up a squeegee, and I tried to print. And uh, I invented like topographical printing, you know, where like off contact was like four inches, and I put like that much ink on a screen. <laughs> Um, and every time I printed with red ink, it looked like a bloodbath. And so they quickly said, Stephen, you're going to stay on the carpet. And there's the carpet where the chair is, and those are the presses back there. And uh, you just do that stuff on the computer, and we'll take care of the printing. And so my business partners, um, born and raised in central Illinois, said, you're going to do stuff in the business that, that we need. You can move the shirts up and down the stairs. You can answer the phones. You can do social media. You can sell to the frats and the sororities like you were. You can do the emails, take in the orders, um, do accounting. And they said, like, that's your role. That's what we brought you in for. You're going you're gonna to help run the business. And uh, the business is open from 9 to 5, so we expect you to be there every day from 9 to 5, answering emails, taking calls, and kind of being the grunt around the shop. 
And at the time, I was like, oh my gosh, like, I got a college degree, and this is my first role, and I don't know if this is what I want to do right now, and it was really tough on me because I felt like I was handcuffed to this business. But at the same time, I knew that I had to learn these different roles. And so I did this for about a year before I had really any help. Um, so I was the secretary, the delivery boy, taking all, you know, like dealing with all the customers, building the website out, trying to do these things, and I made a ton of mistakes. But I learned every little step of the business, and my other business partner, Jed, I said, Jed, I've been doing this for a year now, can I at least hire like a secretary to help me out? And it was simple, he said, put money in the bank and you can do whatever you want. We're not here to take loans, we, we buy in cash, okay, we're farm raised, and that's how we're gonna grow our business. You're gonna learn to save money. You're gonna learn to buy in cash. You're not gonna go take all these loans. And I was like, well, startups in Chicago, he goes, shut up, Chicago boy. This is how we do it down here if you wanna to learn to run a business. And that was really tough for me because I was like, wait a second, everything I've learned in school, how startups work, how to work in debt, how to, how to grow and expand, like, I couldn't do that. Um, but at the same time, I was like, what are my options? My options are I have to sit here and I have to work at it. And so I did, um, and I quickly, made a lot of you know, sales, and we grew really quickly. In the first year, we added about, we grew about 150% just by implementing very basic tasks, and I finally made enough space where I could move into an office. So that was my first office, which was um, Grandpa Joe, our founder's closet. And uh, in my office, that's where I had the ability to think and to really look at my business as a machine and get away from the day to day. And so my talk today about automation is not why you need to buy a direct-to-screen and the fastest presses on the market and unicoders, okay? There's other people in the industry that'll tell you why you need to do that. My business partners said to me, Stephen, you need to put money in the bank before we can go out and spend. And so I knew that it wasn't gonna be buying new equipment, it wasn't gonna be moving into our space, it was gonna be automating everything that was in my control. And if I automated it, I could do whatever I want. And so my simple theory is this, if you automate something, you give yourself as a business owner the liberty to do whatever you want to do. The two rules of automation are very simple. Automation will cost you money, okay? Automation will cost you money. But if you do automation correctly, it will also make you money. And so as I, you know, I've gone to the trade shows, I've met several of you, been on calls, been in groups, Everyone's really hesitant, like, ooh, ship station costs $50 a month. Well, that's $600 that is going to be used for the year to handle all of your shipping. So let them pay them because they're good at their jobs, right? You don't want to have to go online every single time to fill out a, a ticket and go on stamps and do that, but ship station's really good, so use it. At the same time, with automation and technology, I'm gonna go through a lot of different technology we use, we use in our shop. People automate as well. And what I mean by that is this, okay? Who hates QuickBooks? Yes, we all hate QuickBooks. QuickBooks is a tough piece of software to use. It's, it's not easy to use. I'm not an accountant, I'm not a CPA. My bookkeeper even tells me it's tough to use. But every single month, we have an hour, like a power hour, where we reconcile everything. And I talk to shops, I'm like, well, QuickBooks ain't syncing. Well, it's a tough piece of software to use, but if you spend one hour a month, and make a, a schedule of exactly what you're gonna do, you can reconcile your QuickBooks really, really, really quickly. And so every single month we have it on our schedule that we take you know, one hour and we go through every single thing. Same with sales tax. Sales tax is terrible, and as you guys have learned about sales tax, it's changing across the entire country. So with sales tax, we don't wanna overpay the government, we don't wanna underpay the government, so I'm gonna use technology to the best of my ability, but I'm gonna still automate people to test and make sure those things are important to be done correctly, right? And so people automate, technology automates, but it's important to use those two together. My theory was very simple. I was gonna automate as much as I could off press, meaning everything before a shirt gets printed and after a shirt gets printed, and I was gonna constantly iterate and repeat, iterate and repeat. And I was gonna mess up a lot of things on the way but I wasn't gonna wait for you know, like this perfect ship to be built, I was just gonna try, because that's all I could physically do. The one thing I will say is if you get bad automation, it could waste you a lot of time and money. Um, I went to school for engineering. I think I can code a little bit, but I wasn't gonna build all of these tools, and I love talking to people, they're like, well, I'll just build it. Like, Godspeed, it's not easy. I'm not a developer. 
right? I'm going to let the experts do that and do what I do really, really, really well. So be careful about flaky automation or just buying something because you think it's going to work. Make sure you can, you know, it's credible, um, it's trusted, and it's sustainable. The one bad part about trying to build your own software is that technology changes so rapidly that if you don't adapt um, your technology, in two to three years you're obsolete. And the reason I say that is I've known Bruce for five years and I remember when we would meet at Portillo's when we still had another job um, and I saw Printable then to it, it is now and it's, it's iterated, it's tested, it's, it's repeating, it's, it's getting better and stronger and I'm going to let the pros do that and worry about selling. So, the first tool to automation is creating a plan. How many of you guys have a workflow or a diagram? Show of hands. Okay. Um, Red, Redwall, no? Wait. Yes, me? Yeah. Um, talk to us about that. When did you do that in your business? Way too late. Okay. Behind you, Ryan, as well? Uh, way too late. Okay. How long did that exercise take? Uh, that's the funny thing, is it? it Sitting down to actually do it, the activation energy to do it was the hardest part. But once I did it, it became the world's most incredible training tool, and now we use it exclusively. Right. It's just a flow chart. <laughs> it's not crazy. Um, I sat down and I drew up every single part of the business. The tool that I use is called Draw.io. You can do it by hand. Um, but I went down and I sat through every single thing that happens in the business, and I realized that I could control a ton of it. I also realized that mistakes in the business happen for two reasons. Ignorance or ineptitude. Ignorance is just not following the rules. Ineptitude is the break in the system or the, um, the ability to not apply the rules properly because the system doesn't work very well. And so I realized I wasn't going to give my business, my staff, anyone the opportunity to break the rules because my system wasn't working properly. So I work on the system. And I think this is a huge inherent problem in our industry. Who orders promo products? What do you have to do to order promo products? To send a PO, to send a credit card authorization for it. You have to open a new account. You have to send the CRT certification or whatever of your sale of business. I tried to order pens four weeks ago um, from a company and they says they're five to seven days of turnaround. I sent them all my information to PDF and they responded to let me know it wouldn't be seven to ten days till I could open an account with them. And after ten days then it would take seven days before proof approval and then it would take seven days before my product was done. And I responded back and said for as big as your company is I'm really sad that that's what you're doing to lead the industry in automating the customer experience. I know what I'm doing, you guys should know what you're doing. And it was really, really frustrating. Don't be that company, okay? Don't make it difficult for your customers to come to you, and don't make it difficult for your employees to work in your system. I got pretty upset with them on the phone, and the staff at one point just said, these are the rules they've given me. I can't do anything about it. And I really wanted to call someone up there and be like, what are you doing? Um, so with automation, think about reducing the amount of friction for your staff and your customers. Um, so when I first started automating, I tested for a couple KPIs. These are just my KPIs, average job size. I wanted to know every time we were, in, we were working with a customer, how much money that was worth to me. I wanted to know how much we were producing per hour, per day. I wanted to know what our average cost of goods sold on every order was. It's going to be impossible to nail a perfect percent every time, but when I first started, we were producing at 40% you know, cost of goods sold, and I would let my staff know, hey look, let's try to get that down to 30%. Let's bump those prices up just a little bit when we're working with our customers. I started tracking how long we start, when we started working with the customer to when products were delivered, and I incentivized my staff to shorten that gap, okay? Because I really wanted to focus on turnaround time, similar to the Jimmy John's model of when you walk into Jimmy John's, they start taking your order before you even, they start making your sandwich before you order. And that same thing is, well, Jimmy John's is based in Champaign, Illinois. And, uh, you know, I go in there and you're like, holy cow, what's going on in here? And they're all about that customer experience, reducing that friction. Um, I also looked at how often our customers come back, right? And these are just things I just like started to measure, nothing crazy, um, but these are kind of my bases of where I started. Now, our business today um, is growing. 
Uh, we moved out of a 2,000 square foot shop actually last week. We bought a 12,000 square foot facility. We have office managers, bookkeepers, full-time graphic designers, three full-time press operators, a lot of frat boys that help us out. Um, we are opening a second retail location. My business partner's wives now work full-time helping us out. Um, we have grown 300%. I use virtual assistants, um, and now we kind of offer, we're a one-stop shop. Um, and this is literally just this week, this video that you're watching right here, one of my students made for us, right? And so um, this hasn't come out yet. We're actually releasing this all on Monday. But by automating our business, we have really, really started to take off. But it took four years. And it wasn't until the summer where I was like, guys, I think we're ready. We have the money in the bank. We have the system. We're ready to scale. Let's do it. Uh, we also have about 43 students that work for us all across the country. Um, they sell. They design. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that later. So parts that I could control in the business were before a shirt gets printed and after a shirt gets printed. Okay, and my whole theory was if I can't work in the business because I can't print, I'm not very good at it, I'm gonna make a huge mess, I guess I'll work on the business. And it wasn't perfect to start. It was not easy. I was gonna I knew I was gonna have to like make mistakes along the way. I was gonna have to teach my business partners how to use new software. I was gonna have to spend a little bit of money. I couldn't go out and hire a bunch of employees. But I use a lot of tools. And so yesterday, um, I went through every single tool that I have used or currently use in my business. Um, and I go back to this thing to say, I'm not a developer. Um, there's developers that work at all these companies, and all these tools are the ones that we use on a daily basis. Those tools, and I use every tool in the book. Um, they're, no, you know, I'll subscribe to anything. Cost me about $12,000 a year. Okay, so it's not cheap. Um, $12,000 a year has grown us 300%. So if you're not spending more than one to 2% on your technology, that's probably what you should be spending. So think about that for a second. One to 2% on your technology. I'm not saying you have to go out and build this beautiful system or use this crazy CRM. And I was in talking to Ryan yesterday and you guys moved over to Shopify, right? Yeah. And Shopify is just a beautiful app that does its job really, really, really well. Probably less expensive than what you were using before, but they're really good at that technology. Right? And so I use very basic tools that are available on the web, and I use them to their fullest. And you know, my staff just kind of knows we're going to use these applications. Okay? The first tool that all of you need to have in your shop is Slack. Who here uses Slack? OK, great. Slack is AIM for the new generation of businesses, okay, or MSN Messenger, or whatever. But Slack is great because you can create channels, you can have unlimited users, you can transfer files, and you have one record of messaging. So I don't want my staff text messaging each other. I don't, you know, they use Slack for everything, to call each other, to transfer files. I have a record of everything when something goes wrong. You can integrate Slack with every single tool on the web. Um, and Slack is the way that I automate with people. Um, I use a lot of virtual assistants. Has anyone used a virtual assistant from Upwork before? On Upwork, you can go on there, be careful, you can post a job and say, I need help doing this task over and over and over again. You can find some people um, either in the States or offshore, um, and they can help you out. I put them on my Slack, and they are part of our team. Okay? Um, and they're really, really helpful. They I feel like I know them almost after working with them for like a couple of years. But every week they check in with me and I give them like these three tasks to do and they get them done. And they're one of those things where you don't have to like pay a ton of money for it. It could be like 15 or 20 bucks. So we'll give me some of the tasks. Yeah. That you know. I'll give you one example. So and I'll get to this. Um, after our proofs are done, I like to make a special image for our Instagram. We just have like a quilt of all of our prints um, that are still digital. And so one of my free, uh, freelancers will just go find the invoice. He'll go and pull that image, he'll place it exactly on the template how I want it, and he'll just put it in a Dropbox or post it to our Instagram. It's like 15 bucks a week, but I know that I have a running copy of every single one we have that's web ready for our website. That's one. Um, another one that I do is um, in Printavo you can add expenses. And so one of my freelancers will go on SNS Activewear or San Martin find the cost of the goods or the invoice and apply it as an expense to Printavo. So when I run a revenue versus expense report, 
I can track my cost of goods sold. Probably cost me a thousand dollars a year, but that peace of mind has brought my cost of goods sold like incredible. So Slack is the number one tool that you've got to use. So let's talk a little bit about the customer journey, okay? Um, customer walks in the door, customer calls, um, customer emails. The customer journey is very, very important, and it's important that that's a closed loop, meaning it's going to create perfect feedback until a sale is made, right? So this is my math that I've made. Um, and so, you know, we have this initial customer interaction, a really good call, I like when they're on the phone, and they can instantly send them out a quote for approval. Once that quote's out for approval, which is automated through Printavo, it either doesn't get approved or it gets approved, and then it goes back through the loop again to solidify the order and get sizes. So that right there uses a bunch of different tools. One of those tools is Squarespace. Who uses Squarespace? <coughs> Squarespace is awesome. Um, it's really easy to use. It's really clean. Um, SEO on it is really, really strong. It site maps really well. It looks really good on mobile. Um, I was using WordPress for a long time. We switched over to Squarespace, and I love it. But use Squarespace. And then on Squarespace, I use JotForm. Has anyone used JotForm before? It's incredible. Uh, it's Google Forms on steroids. Um, and you can take input whatever you want, customer data, it looks really, really clean. I integrate that with Zapier, and that will push into Printavo to create an inquiry. It also will send a text message to the customer letting them know we've received your inquiry. And I also have it set up to send a Slack message to my office managers to know, hey guys, you have an inquiry, you better handle it, okay? The last two tools we use are called MailTrack and Boomerang for Gmail. Does everyone use G Suite? Google Suite, yeah? How many Outlookers on there? No? Okay. I use Gmail or G Suite. I really like it. I have two tools embedded in there. One's called MailTrack, and all that does is it lets you know if the customer has opened the email. Pretty nice for sales. And the other one is Boomerang. What Boomerang does is you send an email, you hit Boomerang, it goes out of your inbox, and you set a timer for when you want it to come back in your inbox. So you could say, all right, this person doesn't answer for two days, I want it to rope back in so I can follow up. Right? And so now my staff doesn't have to try and remember, oh shoot, who did I send the quote to, or who did I email, or who did I send that to? We boomerang everything. So we're doing our own follow up. Yes? There's another tool called Mixmax, which basically combines those two. Yeah. And then it also lets you do like, write the follow-up when you write the first email. Oh. So you write the first email, you say if they don't open this email in four days, send this like follow-up reply and you don't even need to. Beautiful, it's called Mixmatch? Mixmax. Mixmax. Mm -hmm. Mix and, and it's a Gmail plugin? Yeah. Not crazy expensive, probably. It's not. Um, and those tools just save your employees so much time. <clears throat> I guess to say that I can say, you know, with all the tools that we use, it's something like two employees. All right, so think about that. My employees like using these tools, and it cuts down my labor costs. That's fifty, sixty thousand dollars because we have a system that's that's seamless. Okay. Um, so when that happens at the same time, I'm not going to go through marketing because Shelby did that so eloquently yesterday. But once they go into my job form. I use Zapier, and Zapier is awesome. Does anyone use it here? It's so easy to use. Um, it's, yeah, hit us up and I, I'd be happy to help anyone out. But I put it in my MailChimp, um, in my ad roll, and then I create my custom audience right away in Facebook. And now I don't have to manually go in there and try and figure out, well, did that customer go in there? It's all automated every single time. You can even take it another step further to say, when you add a new email, send them a welcome email saying, thank you for being a, a customer or something like that. I don't know, Shelby, do you use that a lot? Yeah. OK. Yeah. Yeah. We have a huge automation series that, for MailChimp. With Zapier? What? With, with Zapier? I, I suck at that. But OK. No, um, no we, I haven't got there yet, so maybe I'll pick your brain. I will say you can also do, um, you said about custom audiences, you can automate Facebook when you import it into MailChimp. Right. Is that what you're doing? Um, yeah, so they or all do it. Zapier doing that for Zapier's you. Zapier's doing all that for me. Because MailChimp will do that too. Yeah. So there's a lot of different ways you can do it. Uh, Zapier is pretty easy um, to use, and it integrates with all these different apps. Um, and so, you know, it, my marketing is just happening. So then when our marketing team comes in and works, they know that their audience is already built, right? Um, 
So after the order is taken and we've worked with the customer, there's two simultaneous things that have to happen. Goods have to get ordered and art has to happen at the same exact time. You shouldn't wait to order the goods until the art's done or you might not make it in time for that job, right? And so you're gonna go through two different channels, ordering and art approval. Um, and so with the art department, um, the second an order's taken, the artist gets a notification. That's a status in Printavo and they're ready to work. They either need to make mock-ups if it's not on the store, they need to go ahead and send proofs, um, they need to upload them. They have a task list that they follow every single time um, and their own loops based on what happens. They also work in a sense of urgency and so my artists are not to be making artwork, you know, they need to do what's urgent and important first. Um, and so rarely do I catch them working on the wrong thing because we have a standard operating procedure that says jobs that are running first need to go, then this, then this. And if you can't get it done in a day, come talk to me and we need to figure something out. Okay. So the artwork loop, um, very important there. Um, for every shop, it's going to be different. So this is how my shop operates, but your shop might be slightly different in your artwork and your approvals. We also have a loop for when artwork is not approved, because how often do you send artwork out and then the customer doesn't respond? Well, a system doesn't work unless the system checks itself, okay? And so in our system, within 24 hours, we change the color, and now the order has been put on hold, and now the customer has received not only an email, but a text message saying, get in touch with us or we have an issue. If after their first approval and their second approval, they're not contacting us, well, then I'm looking at it and saying, I hope we have the right customer information, and then they're getting a phone call. So you have a little status button in front of top. Yeah, and I'm going to go through. Jobs on hold. Yep. And then customer and doesn't want to hear that. Customer doesn't want to hear that. They don't want to respond to you for three days. They just want to know it's still moving. You know they don't want to talk to you. Right. And so jobs on hold. Your order is now on hold. Yeah. We are not going to do anything until you get in touch with the customer. Yeah. And when I'm ordering promo products, you have to be glued to your phone because you don't know what kind of proof or approval or email they're going to send, if they're going to send one. And, you know, I've taken all of my statuses and all of my emails from all these other shops um, and their approvals, so they're not terribly hard to do. But we're pretty rigid about them because if we're going to provide you a great service at a really great rate or a great value, you need to work with us. And so that customer education and that customer journey is also very important in automating that. Because if the customer doesn't know what they're expecting, well then you're just, you don't know what's gonna happen when they interact with you. I know like Mike, you've got a lot of automation that runs if a customer doesn't respond to a quote or a payment request reminder, like you'll drill them until they get it. It eliminates problems, right? And, and you're kind of covering your rear end. Um, so that's the art department, and the same goes with purchasing, right? We process the worker work order. We like to print out our work orders. I've still got a QR code on there, um, but my business partner really, really likes when that's printed out on his desk. Um, he'll order the goods, but if he has an issue, he's not going to go tell the office manager, hey, products are not in stock at SNS. He's just going to hit a button that says, products are not ordered. It's going to fire an email or a text message to uh, the invoice creator saying, get in touch with your customer. They're out of comfort color and chambray. Right? Um, and how often does that happen? And then we're stalling, and then what do we do? Um, once we see something happen in the system, we apply a status, and we move on to the next thing. We color code everything, and everything in red means that there's something wrong. Okay? Um, so in Printavo, if you were to look into my statuses, I have more statuses that are set to feedback, meaning issues, than I actually have for our workflow. Because how often does everything go and work properly? Rarely does that ever happen, right? And so I work with college students who think they're graphic designers. They're amazing students, they're super passionate, they'll give me an image with 43 different ink colors on there, <laughs> traced and everything like that, missing fonts and outlines, and, and you, know, you know how it goes. And so we have a status set right away. If we're missing an outline, boom, sorry, you need to get us that font. Or if we're missing an ink color, or they're not using our ink colors, your ink colors are not accurate. You're going to need to go in there and change it. And they learn, they, they, you know, this is like what we call gamification. They don't want to feel any friction for their order. So I've given them a checklist to say, if you follow these 10 instructions, I hope we don't have to hit any of the red buttons, right? And the students that are better, the salespeople that are better, go through these and they know right away. 
and I'll get a text message and it'll say, hey, my order status is on hold. And I'll say, go check your email because I've already sent you a video on how to change it. And so I use a tool called Loom. Has anyone used Loom before? You guys saw Adam using it yesterday, but I've created instructional videos that teach our sales students how to do something if something's not correct. And they took me a whole couple days to do, but now I don't have to sit there and message the students and say, hey, right click, convert that font to outline. It's in the video right there. Right? And so we're building our system to scale. Um, and so, like I said, there's a lot of red, and in Printavo, you have those statuses and actions associated to them that you can set up in the back end. Um, like I said, you know, uh, I was on vacation, I got to finally take a vacation, and Bruce FaceTimed me and decided to record it and post it on Facebook. Thank you, Bruce. Um, but we were talking about what it feels to be like on vacation and knowing your shop is running. It was the first time I got to really step away from the business, and it felt really good because at any given point, I could log into the emails and I could see how quickly they were answering emails. And I could see that they had a zero inbox by 5 p.m. And I could see if there were jobs that were on hold, right? And that God view, I guess. So they'll go through and star things that they can't answer. And usually by four o'clock, I'll check into it and see if there's any major issues. Like yesterday, you know, there was an issue where someone didn't pick up their shirts in time. I saw that, it was brought to my attention. We took care of it. But we use Gmail. Um, and I guess it depends on how big you're growing your business, but we have four people that handle all the Gmails and they kind of work concurrently in one inbox and it's good for that. If you're growing out of that, um, then it's time to probably use a CRM like HubSpot or NetSuite or, um, or Salesforce or one of those tools. But until you're really busting at the seams, we use Gmail and it works really, really, really well. Anyway, do you use a different color code for your, you said you were kind of a one-stop shop? Sure. So do you use different color families for each, like the embroidery size? Yep. Uh, we create different tickets for every different type of decoration, and I made that kind of in stone simply because they're completely different workflows. Like, I know you sometimes have a combo order where you get a bunch of shirts and then three hats. I'd rather them just make the separate invoice duplicate the invoice, make it a hat order, because it's a completely different workflow with completely different staff. Um, and while that might seem like redundant at first, it eliminates any of our problems because <coughs> hats go this way, shirts go that way, they meet back. But do you do that with colors? Um, yeah, we use different colors. Yeah, it's a rainbow in there. It's, yeah. it's wild. Can yeah. I ask, just follow up with sure. that? When you said you create kind of separate, like you have your separate loops for each individual type of processing, I think maybe I misunderstood. You create separate invoices for each of them. Yeah. So what comes to the? I don't want to hand my customer four different invoices. Or do you do that? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. you pay for hats. I just let them know on the initial call. Look, we're a one-stop shop, and we're going to offer you both screen printing, embroidery, BTG sublimation. I'm going to separate those out because they're completely different workflows. And at the end, you'll have one. You know, I could combine it. I guess at the end, That's if I wanted to. Okay. Um, but as long as I educate them early on and let them know we're kind of four businesses in one. They don't have a problem with it. And I let them know, look, your sign and banner, it's a different proof. It's a different item, it's different employees, different products. Your screen printed is on the other side of the table and that's a totally different team working on it. Do you have um, any issues that they can't go in and pay a group of invoices? You can, well, they can call in and now you can do a bulk payment uh, under public profile if they want, um, or they just pay the four separate ones. It's like, I realized, I was like, okay, is that a little bit annoying for the customer? Yes but it's going to eliminate any issues early on. I think the goal right now is you can add, right Bruce, you can add a bunch of payments. Yeah, yep. Not, not in the public profile. Not in the public profile, but you can manually do it, right Adam? In the customer profile, it's still you can add to whatever it Yeah. Um, and so that's one of those things where like, I just made the executive decision that said my quality and my workflow is more important than the customer being able to pay those all at once. And I'd rather deal with that friction later and have the job go well. What's up, Mike? Oh, I was just going to say that you can actually set the payment request to like more than what the invoice amount is. If you have like multiple payments you have mm -hmm. to take, and then just run it through the public invoice and take the credit card. So like four or five hundred dollars worth, you can just take two thousand dollars worth. Well, yeah, what we've run into pushback on, and maybe we're doing something wrong. So if we are, tell me. But we've got a school that has payment. to issue a PO, and they issue you one PO, and it's for business cards, banners, and you know, five poles, mm -hmm. and it's all in the same PO. Printavo will automatically fire out what says it's an invoice, which really should be a work order, and, the, and they'll call me up and go, 
is my stuff done? I was like, uh, no, well, I got an invoice. So mm -hmm. I started putting a tag on there that says, this is not your final invoice. Mm -hmm. We're just teasing you. Right. <laughs> we'll send you a final invoice later, but then we run into pushback because that invoice doesn't match the PO because sure. there's three more invoices that's floating around. So I work, on that PO. I work in the state of Illinois, and if anyone knows how messed up our government is, they're really bad at paying bills. Um, and 50% of my business is with the university and they're terrible at it. Pete, you'll have issue cards, you'll have purchase orders, there's 10 different ways to pay it. It comes down to customer education. It's letting them know up front, look, my system is designed to run one way. I'm gonna try and adapt your way of paying, but we're gonna have to work together on it. And it just comes down to educating the customer early on and knowing that their system is not gonna perfectly match with ours. But if you tell them and you communicate really well, like usually they're pretty understanding about it, is what I've seen. Uh, I was just gonna say, if you folks want to see how I put together like invoices for customers that have like twenty or thirty SKUs, um, they only want yeah. one invoice. I'll show you. Yeah, right. and it's one of those things. Like I have a bookkeeper and an admin assistant that goes back and just rectifies those things. And so on her Slack channel, she knows when she gets the tough ones that she needs to get in touch with the customer because this is through Illinois Purchasing. And she'll get in touch with them right away, but on her channel, she's handling them. Where if something needs refunded, I don't go and refund it. I put it in our Slack channel, and she marks it as done. Okay, what's up? Just, just to go back to the question over here about using Gmail. Yeah. Um, one tool you guys can use that I've used, and it's super effective, is Help Scout. It works with your Gmail. Help Scout? You get automated reports to say, like, how long does it take to get the first response. And yeah. You can track different people. You can assign stuff through the news. That's Help Scout? Help Scout. Uh, yeah. We use Help Scout as well. Yeah. I mean, there's tons of tools out there. Uh, Gmail Meter is really cool to show how quickly your replies are. Um, you can get creative with it. Um, so I'll go into like when the job's done, we talked about before the job, I automate after the job's done and so there's a QR code that comes out on the label so that the customer can instantly scan that. There's a follow up email sent one week out for review and what they do is if they just hit a status it'll say would you like to leave a Yelp review or a Facebook review and our staff will do that once a week. Um, my, one of my graphic designers, he'll either make an Instagrammable proof or one of our virtual assistants will help us out doing that. Um, someone will post the campus in prints, which is just our quilt, um, and maybe tag the customer or the student that worked on it. Um, you can use Printavo to ask for reviews. And then the cool part is, if you set a status for reorder or reorder request, um, one of my office managers, when he's not doing anything, uh, he will go through and look at jobs coming up two months from now, a year ago, and he'll just say, reorder request, and it'll send an email to the customer saying, we know that you ordered last year, would you like to get your order started again? And that's through Printout. Though. That's through Printout, yeah. right? And that's just using a status change notification with an email, but that's a funny kind of hack around that helps us get our returning customers. Did you write that, that message, or is that an actual little task? Yeah, so if you go to status change notifications, yeah. Right? And then you set it to email the customer. Then you can put in a custom message that say, we saw that you ordered this invoice last year. Would you like to order it again? And you assign that to a status. Right, Bruce? Did I do that right? Okay. Yeah. So everyone wants to know about sales. How did Steven do his little sales thing with the students and all, and all that stuff? Um, I automated my business, but I'm also automating my sales. And this is what my fun was. Um, what I found out was I love working with these college students that are passionate, that want to design, that want to learn sales, that want these kind of real life opportunities. I love working with them. And so everything we did, we had to automate with the students. And so I hired four students to start on our campus. Um, and now that's grown to 40 students across, I don't know, eight campuses or so. And now that we have our new facility, we're going to start taking it to the moon. Um, but with the students, it was constantly automating with them. And as students that think they know how to design, but are really passionate, really creative, procrastinate, and work from 1 a.m. to 4 a.m. every day, um, I had to really, really limit how they worked in our little game. So they all had limited user access, they all are on Slack, they all go through training and onboarding, and we use Google Drive to track all their sales. And they're like, you use Google Drive? Yep, I hired a freelancer to help me code something in Google Drive. And we have, you know, it's not pretty, but we have 45 students on there, and now we're gonna start developing a system that really, really manages them. And so, with your sales managers, it's the same way. Onboarding needs to be quick and fast and supportive. Resources need to be there so they have their color palettes, their catalogs. They know how to price very quickly. 
okay? I have a pricing matrix that is insane and it gives them incentives on how much they can sell for. And yeah, I didn't use the printable matrix to start with there. I used my own on Google Docs and it works really, really well. And so I'm not saying that you have to use everything and every tool, but you can get really, really creative around the way you do things. Um, and that's kind of our story. That's, that's where we're at. Um, I was forced in this position um, where I couldn't spend all this money, I couldn't buy equipment, I couldn't go into this new space, and this is all I knew how to do. Um, and so that's, that's what I did, is I just automated and iterated and automated and iterated. And that's one thing I see in our industry is we focus so much on our equipment, and it's like uh, the gun show battle, like, you know, what kind of press do you have? It's like, what kind of press do you have? Well, how fast is your customer journey? Because that's more impressive. You know, that, that's more impressive. What's your customer success rate look like? What's your average job size? How much are you pushing out per hour with the presses that you have, right? And those are the things we have to start looking at this from like kind of a supply chain or a logistics standpoint because we are in manufacturing and we're also using technology and we're also using design and we're also offering a service, right? And so for me, it was all about, all about the system, all about automating. And uh, it's been great, you know, getting to know everyone, uh, being younger in the industry. I think our industry is in an amazing spot right now and we've got, you know, we were just trying to calculate, you know, there could be $100 million in this room right now. And we're going to take this business to the next generation and grow it and compete against the big giants that are out there. Um, and if we don't start automating and doing it together, they will wipe us out. And so, you know, it is a survival game a little bit, um, but it has been amazing nonetheless. So thank you, everyone. If you have questions, contact me. I'd love to chat about this. I've got a little time for questions, about like eight or nine minutes. So go ahead. So, how big were you when you implemented the system itself, and then how did the... Well, the system started day one, and I'm still working on it today. But I mean, how, how did your employees react to having to... <coughs> to work that much harder? Get, well, I know it's not much harder, but it makes things more simple, but for yeah. them, they, they're used to, you know... Yeah, I mean, we were doing under, you know, like three quarters of a million dollars at the time when we started. And there wasn't any real staff. I was the first. Okay, so right. everyone I brought on, I was constantly training. But my business partners who have been there their entire lives, they also are embedded mm -hmm. in that system too. Okay. So what about the automation tools? Well, three desks you'd say everyone's doing. Uh, you you know, need to have your Printavo like tightened down. Um, and I'm sure customer success would love to help you with that. Or me, hit me up uh, and I'm, I'm happy to share that with anyone. Um, get your Printavo working in an order that it gives feedback. Feedback is really important to me and then clean up your email. What do you mean by feedback? Um, artwork not found, what happens, in your, what happens in your workflow when things go wrong? <coughs> Automate those first, and they're fun. Yeah, they save a lot of time. Ryan. So do you guys have a regular cadence of reviewing this and updating it? Yeah. What, how, did, how is it, what are you doing? How often? It's usually me, uh, <laughs> late at night. Um, so we're down in Champaign, Adam who works with me, we'll kind of go at bat and just hack away at the business. Um, and then I'll present it to my business partners and, you know, they trust me, I trust them, they're like my parents. If they say, Steven, we need to do this, they do it. Um, it's all about testing and so I figure out where there's, where there's a break in the system. If something goes wrong, I'm not going to get mad if it was my fault because my system was broken. Um, and then I go back to the drawing boards and we keep iterating and testing it, but it's mostly me. Yeah. I like to figure out the problem with her question. So there's a lot, and I was just saying I'm really excited, but also like terrified now to go home. Um, Don't be. Chicago's <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> it's all good. Here, I guess, right? It's a safe space. Yeah, it's a um, safe space. Yeah. yeah. So you. if you were to recommend one, like I've heard a lot of good things about Zapier, and I know that you guys have some videos on Pintago about those kinds of things, which is awesome. If we were to kind of, I want to know like one thing that you would recommend trying. Automation tool. Yes, one automation tool to go home and say, like, let's give this one a shot and see if it cuts down our time um, as far as automation. And I know that's kind are, of. Are you already automating with Printavo, like, as a standalone? Yes. Okay, so if you've already done that, um, gosh, I love Zapier with, like, Jotform. Okay. So Jotform is a really good inquiry tool, and you can ask a lot of good questions, and then you use Zapier, Zapier to connect it to Printavo. And job form just like so job form is basically a request like from a website it goes into job form transfers the print. Yeah, out. job form is a form builder. Yeah, that's it. Web forms. Um, and I love. I would just start using job form to start, 
just to make your customer journey better. And that automates a, an inquiry input top what you said? Yeah, so you'll have to use Zapier. I probably should make a video on this. Jot form to Zapier, yeah. Zapier to Printavo. Okay. Um, yeah. So Zapier is this gateway. Yeah. Any other last questions? Uh, so when you do try something new, a new um, automation system, how long do you test it before you say, okay, all 50 people that all 43 of you students take off with this? Because we're a lot smaller business, but I've found like, I'll be like, this looks really cool. We want to use this. And then we get into it and it's like, it really doesn't do the function we yeah. thought we would. So then I constantly feel like I'm going back and forth with, you know, pushing things out there and then pulling them back and pushing yeah. them out. So how do you... We don't want to push anything we're ever going to pull back. And I've right. made those mistakes. Okay. I've messed that up. I'm like, guys, everyone use this. I bought all these cool vector tools from the vector lab. And all the kids are like, we just use Pinterest. You know? Right. So uh, <laughs> I, you know, I test it out myself. Adam, myself, my business partners, we work with it. We try it out. If it's a game changer for me, I'll make it a game changer for them. Um, but if I feel it and I'm like, eh, we don't really use it, then we just, we don't push it. But it's usually a couple months. Like, we're trying something out. You know, I used Asana for the longest time. If you guys use a task manager, Asana is really cool. And then Adam's like, dude, you have to use Trello. And I'm like, no, I'm neck deep in Asana. And then I tried Trello, and I love Trello. So, you know, sometimes you do have to pull back and try different things. Any other questions? Trello. Trello, 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 Trello. Yeah, Trello cool connected with Zapier. Yeah, you can, yeah. Adam, you use Zapier with Trello, right? I think. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right, guys. Thanks so much.